Yeah. All right, real quick. Let's uh, let's start off with a little yeah. with a little drill here. Chapter three. Oh, oh, not in order. Well, we don't always get them in order. Come on. <laughs> This is better than Moses. Moses. Did, uh, I did cheat though. Did you, what, did you look down with one eye? I did. Yeah, I did. I did. I did. I did. Chapter two. I gotta be honest. Don't drift away. Excellent. Chapter five. High priest. Now four. Need to enter God's rest. Rest. Very good. One. Better than God's rest. Angels. You got that one right. Because we get in order. And chapter six is. Hope is anchor soul. I'll actually use that on the. On a uh, business meeting today about the uh, college I work with. Don't give up. Hope is an anchor of the soul. So we got that going there. Excellent. Well, we'll keep drilling that because, as you know, sometimes you have to look something up and you don't really want to start chapter one to get to chapter 13. You'd like to just like. So, you know, once you memorize them front ways and you want to memorize them back ways and you want to memorize them from the middle out, and then you'll know it at the end of all that. So, we're not going to review all this, but we talked about on, uh, on Sunday. The Christian who falls away, and we talked about the, the characteristics that they had, and the conclusion we came to is we can answer this question, were these people that the writer was talking about, were they in the beginning truly converted, true Christians, not just Christians in name only? The answer was yes, they are. So what was the uh, big deal? They fell away. And of course... This is a great place to go to if you have a friend who's a once saved, always saved, and you're going to encounter that in religious discussions and looking at, at, at all of this. But the, the point here is we can fall away. The Hebrews were drifting away, right? That's why we're getting these things. Don't drift away. Anchor your soul in hope. And so this is really part of this chapter 4 admonition, the strong admonition that they're getting here. The final state of the Christian who had fallen away, we, we really talked at length about, I probably went a little too long on this, but, but just to say here, this Christian is someone who wants Christ out of their life in the same way that the Jews wanted Jesus off the scene. That's why he uses this phrase, crucify again. And that's really, really just poignant language when you, hear, when you talk about that. And yet, have you seen Christians who do exactly that, or maybe for yourself at times, they're just like, I just don't want to be associated with Christ. And you think, but that's a real picture. That that, you know, if he's not in my life, I don't even have to think about, you know, what I'm really doing compared to what he would expect expect me to do. We ended that up with a really, really disturbing statement where he said, putting together two verses there, it is impossible to renew these type of people to repentance. We made the point that that this is not just a Christian who has sinned and has not yet repented of it and turned it around, although it could lead to that. This is someone who's walked that path all the way down to throwing Christ out of their life. And when someone has done that, it's it is um, it is something that it is nearly impossible to have them recover from that. And the question that I asked kind of toward the end of the class: So, what parable of the or what does the parable of the prodigal son of Luke 15 teach us about this particular principle, about it being impossible to renew these type of people to repentance? If you think about the prodigal son, awesome. They have to come to themselves and yeah. hit rock bottom, if you will. They have, they have to hit rock bottom, and they have to decide this is the wrong place for me to be. And remember what they had. And remember what they had. Excellent point. You know, the... Not going too much farther, but Luke 15, there are three lost things in Luke 15. There's a lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Which one's got looked for? Did the lost son get looked for? The father looked away for him, but he didn't come to grab him. The shepherd went to get the sheep. The woman swept with her broom to find all the corners. But when you're in the condition that the lost son was in, that the father would have shown up, but the son would come back, the son's got to decide to come back. And that's just a little, it's a little thought for us to think, if we let ourselves go down that path that far, we get to the place where the only way that we can turn around is to hit rock bottom and turn ourselves around, because there's nothing God can offer us now to turn us around. Tony? Isn't the other side of that is, not only that when we do come back, then... Just like the father in the parable, the, the water will be overly thrilled that we came back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. I mean, 
angels will rejoice in heaven, right? Over one, right? So that's that is the I think that is the great point, the comfort that's there. We didn't get to this, and we're not going to talk a lot, a lot about this, uh, but because I want to jump into a nice lesson. But the Hebrew writer gives us an illustration, and, he, and the illustration is really verses six and seven. And I've kind of broke it out for you here. He talks about fruitful ground, which drinks the frequent rain, which bears useful herbs, which is cultivated and receives blessings from God. And then he talks about unfruitful ground, which gives thorns and briars, like the ones I, that I had at my house, that are rejected, near to being cursed, and it's the end is to be burned. Jesus talked about similar concepts in a parable. Which parable did he talk about that? Ground that is fruitful and ground that bears thorns. So, no fruit. So we're, so we're. Parable so we're, right? And isn't it interesting here that the Hebrew writer brings up an analogy which is straight, really straight out of the parable of the sower, that at the end of the day, it's the ground that decides what it's going to do with the word. And the fruitful ground is obviously those who, who receive the word and convert it and then stick through it through all the perseverance. And the unfruitful ground is those that allow the other things to grow up and crowd out the word from their life of being there. And so it's a great illustration to really end up, I think, this pretty dire warning, a warning that starts in chapter 5 with, you haven't progressed, I can't talk to you about Melchizedek because you're not mature enough, you need to mature, you're not progressing, if you, if you don't progress and you fall away, it's almost impossible to turn you back, you're in danger of becoming a fruitful ground, and Hebrews can be a really depressing book sometimes, can it? But we get to, fortunately tonight, turn the page. And let's turn the page to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 9. Hebrews 6 and verse 9 starts out with... But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Okay? So after giving them a really dire warning, he says we're confident of better things concerning you. Now, I want you to help me think, think this out for the, uh, these three verses here. He describes two states of their being. One is, what is the character that you have previously shown your demonstrated character, the things you have previously done. And then we're going to talk in a minute about what do I, as the writer, in his words, believe you will be in the future. Okay? So as, as we get through this warning about not falling away, he says, I'm confident you won't continue down this path, but you'll turn it around because of your previous character. So what are some of the things he says about what they have previously done? demonstrated in their lives? Work and love. Work? What kind of work, Scott? Serving the saints? Not in chapters not six to nine, I don't think. I think he's, he says there that, that they they have work for God, right? They had shown love Serving. for things in verse nine. And then what what other thing? Ministering. What, what, ministering. And were they still ministering? It looks like it. You, You're still history. ministering. Now, why would that give the writer, hey, come on in, why would that give the writer hope? You have served others, you have shown your love for others, your love for God, you have worked for God, and you are still taking care of each other. Why would that show him that I have better things to think about you? What have they not given up yet? Each other. Each other. Think about the importance of each other and the importance of the church, that even though they're wavering, they haven't wavered to the point at which they had totally given up on each other and, and trying to support each other. Um, I think it's a really, really important point here that, that when, you, when you think about what kind of character they had shown, they had shown the character of true Christians. Yes, they had not progressed in their knowledge. No, they could not yet be teachers. But they had gone to work when they had been converted. And that work had actually been fruitful for the Lord and had been ministering to each other. And why... Do we get so much encouragement from our elders to go to work helping each other? 
There's lots of reasons for that. Here's an example. This, this is something that may hold us up in the day that our faith wavers. That because we have people around us serving us and because we have people who we serve, who we build a relationship with, those things may help keep us together whenever something happens that begins to, to, to knock on our faith. So, so that, was, uh, that was the previous character they had. Oops, both of them came up together. I'll wait to put the others up. What about the future character? What about, what's he confident about in their future? And that's going to mostly be verses uh, 10, 11, and 12, right? What's he confident they will do in the future? Not become sluggish. Okay. All right, what else? Show the same earnestness um, of the hope. That they had the assurance, full assurance of hope yeah, keep until the end. Alive. Yeah, yeah. Okay. What else? <clears throat> Imitate those who, through faith and patience, okay, receive the promise. Imitate the faithful. I'm just going to put maybe separately in the patient. And it said not be sluggish, which I was saying, oh, let's see. Sorry, this <laughs> so you will imitate the faithful, imitate, imitate the patients, imitate these people who have received the promise. Okay. Now, now I can bring all those up. You got them all. Excellent. You're reading the same versions of the books that I am. You're reading that. <laughs> so, so think about the argument, the, not the argument, the appeal he's making to them here. You know what it's like to be God's children and to work for God. You demonstrate it. This is not foreign to you. These aren't just, well, they might be babes in their knowledge. They're not babes in their, in their in the ability to actually do work and make things happen. And he says, I'm confident that you can despite all the admonitions he's given to them, imitate the faithful, imitate those who are patient, that you can actually inherit God's promises and that you will that you will not be lazy or sluggish. Okay. On that list, is there one thing that is a maybe a key element in maintaining the momentum from where we start as Christians with zeal and work and what it takes to patiently endure even persecutions and receive the promise. What what's the key ingredient that comes out of that list? Okay, hope hope is one of those things, but but there is a key ingredient that actually I think is helps us to see that hope. That's not really that's not really uh, here. It's it's his not word. What's his not word? That you will not be something so that you will be something. You not be. Lazy, not be sluggish. What carries us through challenges to our faith? Work for God. Continuing to do what God's asked us to do. We're not going to avoid these challenges. We're going to give them to. We get them to. I know it. I, for my for my look like. And I also know in my life when I got lazy, when I got busy, I got distracted, and I just stopped working. Okay. Does that face stay on that same level? No, it starts slipping. And, and bad things start happening here. The difference between how we have been and the momentum we need to carry on to, to take us to those higher levels of how we actually can be these people is a commitment to actually just keep working through it. And, and why you keep working through it is because hope is out there. Because you know that if you keep doing what God would have you do, that God is going to fulfill His promises. And that's what carries you through. But the minute you and I stop working, that we get frustrated, that we don't like something that somebody said at church, or we, it gets hard you know, to, to do something. The minute that happens, we've just opened the door. We've opened the door for the kind of things to happen that were happening to the Hebrews. They were seeing the persecution and they were getting shaken by it. And they were thinking about stopping. And they were starting to drift away. Does that, does that make sense? 
Yeah, I think it makes sense. I think that for like in comparison, like um, for us, for them, depending on our situation, it's more that we're gonna go back directly into sin versus like for them, it was much more about like the culture. Like well, so, if, so if we come from a culture that is seems easier because it's easier for us to slip back into, whether that is just a sinful culture or if that's a culture that's just like uh, you know more prevalent that we would feel more comfortable in, then that's gonna be like that's. I think majority, so I, I think it, it makes sense. But I think for us, it's finer for them. It was there was a lot of different things for them. Yeah. Is that fair? No, no. It, it, there's actually each one of us has a, has our the own thing, the, the own set of things around us that, that I would just say the devil's attacking us with, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter which one he attacks us with; it works. If he finds one that works, and he he gets us to stop working and start putting aside our Christianity and not relying on it as much and stopping doing all those things that we know we need to do, he's won, right? He's, he's got us walking that path that the Hebrews were walking. And that's really what the Hebrew writers here to shake them up and say, hey, stop. Get back to what you were doing. This is how you actually keep that hope and, or generate that hope. And then he's going to tell them some more things here in a minute. I, I, I just found it interesting. I just went through and, and we're reading through Acts. I won't read all these passages because we don't have time. But Acts 5. Whenever they, whenever Peter and the apostles were arrested and told not to preach anymore by the Jewish council, they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then he does what? He says, you're the one who murdered the Son of God and put him on a tree, and you need to repent. What did, he, what did he go back to do? Even to them who told him not to keep preaching. He preached to them. What did Stephen do? They're throwing the rocks at him. He's preaching to them. I actually believe put that together with Acts 9, I think Stephen got the pump to Paul, got the Saul. Because the way Stephen died, I actually think, made an impact on Saul that bothered him. And that's what Jesus said, well, you, it's hard for you to kick against the, the goads. But that's what's happening. He's like, why would this guy do this? Why would he be this committed to this? So, that's just for here or there. Acts 14. Paul gets stoned in Lystra. What happens next? They drag him out of the city. He gets up. He, he's not... He's miraculously healed of that stoning. He goes to the next city, and then what does he do next? He comes back to Lystra. He goes preaching again. And he wants elders in the church. In Lystra, where they stoned him and took him out. When the devil tries to discourage you, what do you do? You walk right back in his face and say, no, no. Maybe it's not easy for us to do, but that's example after example here. Acts 16, Paul and Silas get, get thrown into prison in Philippi. What's, what do they do when they get down in prison that first night? Sing and pray. Sing and pray. <laughs> and here they are converting people. And actually then think, you know, the Philippian jailer and Lydia formed the basis of that first church. Who's the church that supported Paul almost all the rest of his career? Those people. So, example after example after example. And that's what the Hebrews writer is trying to tell the Hebrews, that when your faith gets challenged, lean into it and keep working for God. Now, is there consequences for that? Absolutely. But again, we've already talked about in chapter 3 and 4, the consequences of walking away from God are much more dire than the consequences of man can be out. Joan, you were going to say something. I was just thinking, um, when I was having some problems um, in my life, I was trying to think of specific... Um, mm, specific things that would just help strengthen my faith. Um, I even, I made a picture of love, of faith, of hope. And I thought, what about endurance? What can I, what can I think of from the Bible from the, for that? And I wrote Paul, the Apostle Paul. Because he kept getting up. How many times do we get knocked down and we feel like not getting you back up? Well, he was knocked down a whole lot worse than we are, and he kept getting up. Yeah. So. I, I think I think those are excellent things to remember because those. I think this verse points out, along with a lot of other places that we can read, James and others, that faith is not just something that goes on in our mind; it's our mind causing our body to do things that are in service to God and each other and to our brethren. And that's what then gives us that reinforcement loop that then makes our faith stronger, at which we're able to actually do more the next time. We're not. We're never earning our way there. We're just showing God. If we're about to talk with Abraham. We believe, it. and 
whatever you need me to do, I'm just going to try to do it even if I don't understand it. And that's really ultimately what's, what, God, what God is looking here for. So uh, ex excellent points. We're headed toward our verse, our verse for the chapter here. God's promises are sure. Hebrews 13, uh, 6, 13 through 18 um, talks about, and I hope you read that and studied through that. We're going to just go a little quick here. We've got about 15 minutes here. God's promise to Abraham, I put here, was doubly sure. That's one of the things this passage talks about. Why was God's promise to Abraham doubly sure? There's no one above him. Okay, so no, what, what, why did that matter? That there's no one above God? What did God do? That you need so. He swore an oath, right? And the Hebrew writer says normally when someone swears an oath, they swear by someone greater than themselves, but who's greater than God? Nobody. So he swore an oath. What other way is God's uh, his promise sure? This is actually the easy half of that. God doesn't lie. God doesn't lie. God made the promise. God doesn't break His word. God didn't need to swear. God already said. He didn't need to make an oath and swear by Himself. But He did it anyway. So, so isn't, that, isn't that interesting? Now, if you actually go back and read all those accounts, and I didn't ask you to do that, but, but the, this is an interesting point that, that, that I looked at a lot of study. God only does this making an oath one time to Abraham. He, he, he says the promise to Abraham to set, remember the promises, I'll give you a son, make them a great nation, multiply your seed upon the earth, and give, give, give the, uh, the, uh, the Savior, the promise of the Savior, uh, the, the blessings promise. He makes that over and over to Abraham, he makes it check Israel. But he only swears to the Abraham that this is true by himself one time. Does anybody remember what had just happened when God made that? Or take a good guess what had just happened. What? God you sacrifice Isaac. Isaac. Yeah. Abraham had had gone through, except God stopped him at the end. But he had mentally gone through with his sacrificing Isaac. Of course, we know that Abraham thought in his own mind, well, this is the promised son. If I kill him, God will raise him from the dead. Because God's made that promise. Abraham trusted God so much, he was willing to do whatever God said. And it was after Abraham had demonstrated that absolute trust that not only did God repeat the promise, he swore by himself this was true. And, and just, just really, I think, is, is, is an interesting, interesting point here because the Hebrew writer says he did that so we would know that it was true. That we would be assured that it was true as Abraham's heirs. And so God's word and God's oath were the, the, the double example. What about Abraham does the writer of Hebrews talk about in his example? He, he shows two qualities. You know, the qualities we, we keep talking about over and over and over again. Two, Abraham's qualities. Patiently waiting. And because he had patiently waited, it says he obtained God's promise. Endurance leads someone to attaining God's promise. Now, let's let's hold on a minute. God made him four promises. Which ones did Abraham see? We saw the son promise, right? What about the make it making him a great nation? How many people when Abraham died, how many people were in that nation? Three or four, right? Not many. Didn't see, didn't see the many nation, didn't see Jesus coming and doing all that. So how did Abraham obtain God's promise? What does that mean? When he says Abraham patiently endured, God swore this oath to him that his promise was sure, and it says, and Abraham obtained his promise. He didn't say later he was going to get it. How, how did that happen? He trusted in God. He trusted God, and for that trust, what did God give him back? He gave him surety. His oath was, was surety that your trust in me is not misplaced. I am 100% capable of, of doing for you what I promised you, and I am going to do that. The assurance of God's promise is what we get when we patiently endure. So if, if you're someone who's being persecuted and you're wondering if it's worth it, 
Are you going to make it? It is. Is what the Bible says about going to heaven really true? Is it, you know, I had to sacrifice myself like Stephen. Is that really the right thing to do? As Abraham, what happened to him? Help us to understand what we need to do next whenever we, whenever we're challenged like that. If we expect to receive God's promise, some of which are things that are going to happen in the future, beyond our lifetime, times that we can't see, and doing that, we have to actually look at it the same way Abraham did. It's absolutely sure God's going to carry through with His work. And God has told, just like God's told Abraham, He's assuring us it is absolutely sure that I can deliver what I can. Because whether we know, God not only cannot lie, He's, he's sworn on top of that uh, that, he, that He will do this on His power. If God were to break His promise, what do we know about God? He's not real. He's not real. Yeah. He's not God. Because God is incapable of lying. He's 100% pure and righteous. He's fully capable of demonstrating the power that He has. And if God were to break this promise, He's not God. So we're back to what Paul talked about in, in uh, the first Corinthians. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. Let's go party. Because we're going to die one day and this is it. And then interesting that he, that he puts it like this. Now, these people, the Hebrews, they were going to try to go back to Judaism and find God. At this point here, God can't bring this promise to you. You're not going to find God there because there is no God. But let's take the flip side of this. You know there's a God. You know God's promise to Abraham. It was sure. Guess what? That's made to you. And that is made to you because you are heirs of Abraham. You're heirs of Abraham. And how were they heirs of Abraham? The Hebrews. What's the obvious way they were heirs of Abraham? Bloodline, right? Who else was heirs of Abraham, by the way, at this time? Was it just the Jews? No, it was the Arabs, and it was the Ishmaelites, and it, everybody in that region was heirs of Abraham. Abraham had not just fathered one nation, he fathered a whole bunch of nations in doing, in doing this here. So that wasn't what he was talking about. So how were they heirs of Abraham? Now this is the way Paul talks about in Romans, the fourth chapter, all the way through the seventh chapter. We won't go and look all those things up, but Abraham is was their father, just like Abraham is our father, because we are kin to him through what? Through faith. Abraham was the father of our faith, and when we demonstrate a faith like Abraham demonstrated, when we trust God and go ahead, despite the difficulty, and do what God asks us to, to do, then we are children of Abraham. And we are heirs of the same doubly sure promise that God is going, to, is, going to, is going to bless us and not make of us a great nation, but have the benefits of being, um, being in Jesus who is that blessing for doing that. Does that make sense, or is that just right over everybody's head? Right over everybody's head? That's the argument that I, that I think he's making here. When he when he does talk about Abraham. So in verse 18, he ends this section by saying, we have a strong consolation who had fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. So how does God set hope before us? And how do we lay hold of that hope? First of all, how does, how does God set hope before us? How did He set it before Abraham? Why did Abraham believe God? God had made Abraham what? A promise. Because God made us a promise. So that's the first thing. There is hope before us, and that hope is a promise. Believe in my son, follow, and follow him. Believe he will be baptized, you will be saved. Um, and all the other ways that, that that promise comes into place. But we have to do what? Is that promise just, just, just for us? Is there anything we have to do? Well, this, this writer, the Hebrew writer says, we have to flee to refuge. What's that mean? They were being persecuted. So if they were going to flee from refuge, refuge persecution, in Jerusalem, what that mean for them? They, they picked up and left, right? But what if these Hebrews couldn't pick up and leave and do that? How do you flee for refuge to hope? Thank you, God. So what you're trying to say? <laughs> like, you're, like, you're, like, 
You have to get. You do have to get closer. You have to get closer to God. You have to trust God. You have to actually look at that promise and say, "That's going to happen." I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow, but I'm going to get through it because I know what God says is going to happen. And I know the, the, the value of doing that. And so it's consoling to us whenever we're facing difficulties if we actually know the promise is sure and then if we do our part to show God that we trust Him and we'll keep serving Him no matter come to what way, thanks should give us consolidation. Now what did the Hebrews have if they were about to go away? Were they cons were they consoled or were they something else? If you're being persecuted and you're about to go away, what are you likely? Fearful, right? If you're about if you're being persecuted and you're about to turn away from God, why are you turning away from God? Fear. So does fear does consolation happen Doubting. in fear? Doubting the same thing? Can we be fearful and consoled in God? We're going to read later on in Hebrews about boldly going to the throne of grace. This is kind of the first little, little sprinkling in the in the test of the test. Uh, in order to serve God, we can't be people of fear. Because you can't be people of fear and actually believe the promise, have the hope, and then walk around in fear that, 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 that something bad's going to happen to me because I'm a Christian and doing that. And we don't we haven't yet ourselves, I think, had to deal with that in the face of physical persecution. <coughs> Hope we never do. Hope our kids never do. But in reality, when that happens, as it will and as it has many, many times, the only way to actually survive that is to actually know that that fear can't move us. When that fear moves us, um, that we we will never find that hope and that, and that peace that's there in serving God. And when that fear does go away and when we are consoled and we believe God's promises, no matter what path we have to walk, we actually can walk that path with His help and doing that. Thoughts, questions before we go to the very last thing here? Joan? I was going to say other fears and doubts can also take away our hope and our consolation. What? Just, just COVID. I mean, I would, you know, what we get a long time for that, right? No. I mean, you, you don't have to go, you know, about a few thousand miles north to find a, a nation that actually shut down churches, you know, under threat from, from worshiping together for, from COVID. You know, here it was strongly suggested, but there it was actually a legal tough situation. What did we actually do? Glad we didn't have to actually face that one here. But the reality is the fear I might catch something and die that I don't have versus let's figure out how to not catch it and do what God sent me to do. I rattle a whole bunch of Christians, right? So and why didn't we shut down then? If we had, we didn't, if we're not going to go. We're not going to go there. Looking at that as, as that <laughs> first month happened and then all those kind of things happened. But the reality, but the reality is, when we get when we get an oper when we get um, pushed to live by fear versus by faith, we got we got to stop and ask ourselves what exactly are we fearing and why are we fearing it versus have we decided we're we don't trust God. Um, that we decided that even if something bad happens to us because we assemble, that we shouldn't assemble. I mean, if the police were here dragging us away, would we not? Would we come or not? We don't have to explore that one yet, but would we or not? Think yet, things we have to think about here because those are the kind of things starting to happen to these people. And looking at that, okay, let's let's turn the page here since the, since this happened here, and let's actually get to our our chapter theme, which is at the end of the chapter. Yeah, we actually had our summer series talking about um, the nautical theme and the anchor of the soul. We talked about this a lot. I'd like for you in your mind to, to draw a picture with the words the Hebrew writers put on the paper. So what, what picture do you see that he drew for us? What's the first and most obvious picture we should have in our mind? It's in bold here, right? Hope is what? An anchor, right? Okay, so you got to see an anchor, right? And what's an anchor usually connected to? Chain. A chain, right? Dropping an anchor with no chain does you no good. It's con connected to a chain, which actually then is connected to the boat, right? So we're the boat, right? We were told not to drift away, so we must be the boat, drifting and boating all that. Okay, what's the second part of this image here? We got here, here's an anchor connected to something. It's sure and it's steadfast. It's kind of like God's double promise. 
sure and steadfast. It's not going to move. Where is that anchor placed? Well, it's behind the veil. So for, for the Hebrews, that meant the most holy place, right? Now, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I'll just give you a preview. That's heaven. That's the throne of God now. For them, it was a place in the temple. You, you'll see the Hebrew talk. So that anchor chain is plopped down in heaven through the veil, and it's anchored right there. And how did it get there? Jesus took it. <clears throat> Jesus took it there and He placed it there. So if we hook up to the other end, are we going to get moved? What's, what will possibly move an anchor off the throne of God that Jesus put there? Now we know that. Why, why, why do we get rattled in our faith when something tough happens to us? Well, it's because we forget that we have hope of God's promise. That's what rattles us and takes us away. Anything interesting about this word forerunner? Jesus not only took it there, it says, it just said Jesus entered for us. He, he gave him a label, Jesus the forerunner. What does that imply, at least? If Jesus is the forerunner, what are we? Others will follow. Yeah. Others will follow. Who specifically others? Us. Right? You and me. That... Where can, where can we go if we're anchored up to this chain, to this, to this anchor? Right where Jesus is, at the throne of God. And that's where we go. That's why it's so important to endure. Because it is faith and endurance that allows us to see this hope, allows us to know we're anchored, allows us when the storm is battering to not let go of that anchor, but to hold on to it, suffer whatever we have to suffer through, because not only is, did Jesus place it there, he actually paved the way for us. What was that word we used in chapter 2? Jesus was a... Remember that? What of our salvation? He was. Some versions say author of our salvation. Captain. Some versions say captain. But there's one other one. What's the first one into a territory sometimes called? Pioneer. pioneer. He pioneered the way. Same idea that's here. Jesus laid down the way by which we can actually be a throne of God Boy, that's a comforting thought, particularly when we're facing troubles and doing this. And so after all that, after all my hand waving and everything else, the author finally gets to what he had to take a two-chapter interlude to not get to, and that is because he became a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Remember how this whole discussion actually started in chapter 5? Jesus was a, was a priest that said, I have Melchizedek, of whom I have much to say, if you could understand it. And then he goes off and says, but you can't because you haven't progressed. So we've really taken this chapter and a half diversion into you have to keep working on your faith. You have to stay close to God. You have to keep working for God and showing this character if you're ever going to get to understand that you are going to actually be able to be there with Jesus because He's pioneered the way to heaven. We can hold on to that hope while we're here, and we can actually be in the presence of this high priest who, according to the word of God, that. And on Sunday, we actually go to chapter 7, which is about Jesus, the high priest of Melchizedek, which is a really hard subject. So we're going to tackle it and try to make it easier than, than it has been for us. So we'll see. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for putting up with me. And uh, sometimes my questions trying to prompt you for what I'm thinking of when you're not thinking of that. But hey, that's. That's part of the course, so I uh, really enjoy it tonight. Hebrews 7, Sunday morning. We'll take two lessons to study that as well.